Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, in for Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today in the U.S., are Asians the model minority? We'll look at how even good stereotypes of Asian American success can be damaging. Our guest digital producer, Julio Ricardo Varela, is here looking out for your live feedback. Julio, I know this is something that resonates with our community, right? Resonates is an understatement. Mm -hmm. as, as with the AJ Stream community, when you talk about identity, ethnicity, race, right. just cultural issues, uh, the community shows up. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is to sort of frame the conversation by starting with a video comment by, uh, by Caitlin. So let me, let me play that a little Sounds bit and kind of give us what it is about the model minority myth. Here's Caitlin. So the Asian model minority myth does two things, right? First, it defines all Asian Americans as hardworking overachievers. And second, it uses that myth of the hardworking overachiever to put down other people of color, to say if you just worked harder like an Asian American, then you too would be able to get ahead. Um, and that puts Asian Americans in a double bind, right? So you're either a hardworking, overachieving tool of the oppression, or um, you're not representative of your race. So keep tweeting in your comments at hashtag AJStream. Looking forward to those. Well, joining us on set is Ellen Wu. Ellen is an assistant professor of history at Indiana University and the author of The Color of Success, Asian Americans and the Origins of the Model Minority. Ellen, it's great to have you here in the stream. I'm so excited to be here. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Now remember, this is a show that's driven by you. So if you have a suggestion for a future show, tell us at facebook.com slash AJStream. Your story could be in the stream. Bonjour, danse. My name is Clayton Thomas Mueller, and I am the co-director of the Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign of the Polaris Institute, and I am in the stream. Is there such a thing as a good stereotype? For Asian Americans, the model minority myth characterizes their group as academic overachievers who are hardworking and successful. Listen to how some YouTubers are discussing this. Why are you Asian when everyone thinks you're a nerd? Asians are always very smart. No, not all the time. I got a B plus on my report card once. Asians are so good at math. Most people agree that Asians are smart. But are they smart because they study, or do they study because they're smart? No, I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is that we're taking over the university! Woo, woo. <laughs> Colleges, grad school, give me that, give me that, give me that! I like them. Well, all humor aside, statistics show that Asian Americans are the highest income earning, best educated, and fastest growing group in the United States. But there's more to those numbers as many advocates say the idea of Asian success is overshadowing serious issues faced by their communities. Mm -hmm. To discuss this, we have via Skype in Los Angeles, Christina Wong, a comedian and writer whose work has examined Asian American mental health issues. In New York, Suman Ragunathan, Executive Director of South Asian Americans Leading Together, or SALT. That's an advocacy group in the U.S. And in Los Angeles, we have Ova Sao Pang. He's an actor and writer whose theatrical works are based on the Lao American experience. Welcome to all of our guests. Now let's start the conversation here in the studio, exploring how we got from a point in time where Asian immigrants were literally being shut out of the U.S to seeing this group become known as the model minority. Ellen, can you give us a, a brief history lesson? Sure, I'll try to keep it very brief. Um, so it's a very startling transformation. So before uh, World War II, since about the middle of the 19th century, when people began to come to the United States from Asia in large numbers, um, Asian Americans were definitely shut out of mainstream American society. They were thought of as the yellow peril, and um, they were really subjected to a whole web of laws and social practices designed to exclude them from all um, facets of American life. So they could not vote, they couldn't become naturalized citizens, they couldn't own property, they couldn't marry white folks, they had to attend um, segregated schools and live in segregated neighborhoods, and they only could take, for the most part, the most undesirable kinds of jobs. Um, and so I started to think, how did Asian uh, immigrants go from the yellow peril to the model minority in what seems a very short amount of time, really, because by the 
40s, 50s, and 60s, Asian Americans all of a sudden were thought about in this very different way, right? Exactly what you were saying earlier, mm -hmm. successful and hardworking and so forth. And, and what I found in my research was that this transformation of becoming or inventing the model minority came about first and foremost by America's global ambitions. So during World War II and then the Cold War, the United States was very interested in kind of amassing kind of a global street cred, right? By being by proclaiming itself as the leader of the free world, American uh, leaders knew that they would have to start cleaning up race relations at home, right? Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't fight a war wars in the name of democracy right. without doing that. Right. Um, and so, as a result, American policymakers started to dismantle systems of exclusion, like Asian exclusion, like Jim Crow. Um, at the same time, Asian Americans themselves were very invested in being acknowledged and um, accepted as full-fledged American citizens. And they also, many Asian Americans, Chinese and Japanese in particular, worked very hard to portray themselves as model citizens. And so these efforts then got picked up and re deployed by the 1960s in the midst of the black freedom movement as civil the calls for civil rights and black power were going on uh, both liberal conservative commentators observers policymakers started to point to uh, Chinese and Japanese Americans and say well look like you know here's a group that seemed to have made it in American society they've got all the right values family values um, they're patriotic you know the Japanese American soldiers of course during World War II they're anti-communist uh, and so holding this up basically holding this group up as a model and right, holding it up right. as something to aspire but to very explicitly against two different groups. First of all, very much um, a model vis-a-vis -vis African Americans to mm -hmm. say, look, you know, those people, you know, out in the streets, you know, they're complaining, etc. Um, look at this other group who seem to be quiet, getting along just fine. And if um, they could do it, then why can't exactly. you? Julio, I know that there are community members who are saying Yeah, and they're actually saying exactly what, what mm -hmm. the professor's saying. I'm going to share a couple of comments. And here's Susan, who's uh, Japanese American. She says, the concept of a model minority was manufactured to justify mm -hmm. racism against African Americans while offering a kind of second class status to some Asians. Mm -hmm. But also the whole issue of the model minority I is already being challenged. Like here's Lucas Shama who says, you know, growing up, it, being a model anything is de facto not cool. And he hated being placed in a box, mm -hmm. hated it. Mm -hmm. So you can see that people are just, are just talking about the model minority, Mal Malik, and, and we should just toss it out to, to our guests because it's, it's definitely a topic that um, is is something that it really resonates with everybody. Right, right. So, Christina, let's take that to you. That, that of course, y you saw that person talk about being put in a box. Is that how you felt growing up? Absolutely. Like when I was growing up, um, I I was. I, you can't tell because I'm so gorgeous and smart and <laughs> modest. Um, but I was quite miserable growing up, and um, and I still never know. Is, was it was it clinically depressed or was it just Chinese? And like I, I, I was under a stress that I think my non-Chinese friends could not identify with. And when I tell my white friends now about just the stress I was under, like even my friends who were like super emo now are like they're like say what? Like they're just like, they're, they're like. Like, oh my God, I'm like Richard Simmons compared to like wh whatever stress you were under. Um, I don't know if that was a, a weird reference, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I got so the reference, I got it. But <laughs> the, the idea is I, um, in the work that I do as, a, as an artist now, I uh, have worked a lot with the issue of, of mental health in Asian American communities and specifically the high rates of depression and suicide among Asian American communities. And this is surprising for a lot of people because they think, oh, but Asian Americans are so, they're so, uh, smart and successful. They seem fine to me. That's the phrase that I hear all the time as someone who tours a show about the issue and is addressing the issue is like, what's wrong with them? They just, they're so beautiful. Why would anything be wrong? But I think it is this perception that everything is fine and also, um, sort of uh, culturally, at least for me, like the idea of seeing a therapist is not really something that you do. It's it's a foreign idea to, to pay money to go see someone. Um, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions that if, if you see a therapist, you might not get a job, but when you're older that it will- Is that what your, your parents status. told you? Yeah, yeah, they said it's too expensive and someone, and I was like 11 years old, right? And I'm like, and I had uh, grown up watching the show Growing Pains mm -hmm. where <laughs> Kirk Cameron's 
uh, father had a therapy office in their house. Uh, and, I, and, and it seemed like, wow, it seems like magic. Well, I want that. I want some wizard, like, not that he's a wizard, but I want a therapist to fix everything, right? right. And, um, and I remember asking my mom about it. My mom was born in America, right? And she's just like, oh, it's so much money. And if, if anyone finds out, even at 11, that you saw a therapist, you won't get a job when you're older. And, it's a, and, and I don't think that it's that uncommon from what other um, Asian Americans, at least from having, you know, toured the show around the country and talked to other Asian Americans, it's, uh, it's, it's very shameful to admit that something is wrong with your family and and I uh, and 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 like for my grandparents they were like running from communists in China so that's why they stayed under the radar it's right. not right of course that <laughs> makes sense that, they were, that makes sense well, Christina yeah. I want to pick up on something you said and, and push it to yeah. Suman because um, yeah. you said for other people it seems they seem fine to me this seems like a, a, a great thing to be so Suman I'm, I pulled up on my screen here this is a, a Pew study now this is um, stats from 2010 but Pew recently updated their study um, using statistics last year using 20 12 data and here you see Asian Americans leading others in education and income US population uh, about 28 percent among Asians 49 percent median household income down here for the US population it's about forty nine thousand dollars for Asians sixty six thousand dollars so when you see things like this Suman uh, w what's lying beneath that that isn't so great uh, well, what's lying beneath it for us, you know, as South Asians, we face a very interesting dynamic where we have a very big tent of a community. So yes, um, you know, median income for South Asian Americans in particular is really high, but, you know, um, the fourth largest sending country of the nation's undocumented population are Indians, right? We are, there are almost 250,000 undocumented Indians in the country alone. Uh, we have major... So that's um, incredible because... It's huge. I, I, mean, I would say, I mean, I'm speaking for myself first, but I think others might agree that when you hear the word undocumented immigrants, most people think of the U.S. southern border. They think of Mexico. Right. They don't necessarily think of people coming from South Asia. Absolutely. And they don't think, for example, of the Nepali uh, domestic worker or, um, you know, the Bhutanese high school student who's struggling in school because they are, you know, really um, struggling to acclimatize themselves to the U.S. education system. They don't think about the Bangladeshi or the Pakistani limited English proficient taxi driver who's just just barely getting by, right? So, you know, when we uh, speak to the experience of South Asians, certainly we have um, some folks who are very high, high profile who have really succeeded, quote unquote, in this country and founded Silicon Valley companies. And we, we welcome their success story, but we also really want to lift up the diverse set of stories of other South Asians who are, you know, frankly, facing many of the same uh, struggles and barriers that many other poor and working class immigrants have faced in this country for decades. Oh, I see you here, nodding here, your head. Here, here. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm nodding my head, responding to everything that Suman and as well as uh, the data had. You know, when, when I look at the data, I'm asking, what Asians are you talking about? What Asian Americans are you talking about? Because Asian America is a diverse uh, array 20, of, uh, you know, Asians. So that's yeah. what I mean. And so if it's focusing on the, the Chinese and that Japanese who have been here longer, I mean, you're looking at a Southeast Asian American man here from Laos. Um, when Suman was mentioning, um, you know, uh, the, the newest immigrants and refugees, I've been working recently with Southeast Asian uh, refugees and immigrants here in Los Angeles, uh, Cambodian, Burmese, you know, and they're coming here and they're struggling. Um, talk about uh, in terms of uh, graduation rates for uh, Laotian Americans, 38% uh, of Laotian uh, high school students, uh, that's 38% that's is the dropout rate for these Lao Americans. I'm one of the few that, I mean, I'm not a model minority, but I'm an exception, mm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not part of that. Right. So, um, well, personally for me, go, go ahead. I oh, know our community, um, Malika, is actually talking about the myth and actually the, the whole concept of buying into the model minority myth. And I just want to share a tweet by Amin and kind of share it with, with the guests. And it says, it's because many Asian Americans actually buy into the quote unquote model minority narrative. So, Suman, that's a really sweeping generalization in terms of the model minority narrative and the Asian American community is buying into it. How would you respond to that and how would you challenge that? 
I would say that, you know, I actually don't think that there is a level of buy-in. I think that uh, many of the South Asian uh, folks and communities that we work with actually identify, frankly, with many other immigrants as coming to the U.S. for more opportunity and don't appreciate, frankly, being pitted against uh, their Latino or African-American neighbors, right? Um, I think that uh, many South Asians really strive to, um, you know, live up to the dreams that they came to this country with, similar to the waves of immigrants who came before for them. And so, you know, I would actually question whether folks actually buy into that myth or whether they're just trying to, um, you know, push their lives forward and frankly make a better life for their children. You know, those undocumented South Asians that we work with who are organizing protests against, you know, the NYPD or uh, writing uh, op-eds urging uh, South Asians to sign up for the Affordable Care Act. You know, I think that those folks are really trying to push forward their communities to just make a better life for themselves in the U.S. Well, I want to talk about some of those obstacles a little bit deeper, dive into some of those obstacles, because Christina, you mentioned in your answer, you talked about mental health. And of course, you have a, you had a show that was touring that dealt with that. Um, I, I wrote down one quote that you, you said a little bit earlier. Was I clinically depressed or was I just Chinese? So I want you to have a look at this. Uh, this is a graph from AAPI Voices, Asian American Pacific Islander, um, Voices.com. Percent of high school students who seriously considered suicide, these are 2009 statistics. You have Asian in blue and non-Hispanic white in green for total 18.9 percent among Asian Americans, 15.5 percent among non-Hispanic white. So what do you tell people who might, you know, might be in this category of high school students considering suicide? Where do they turn to? And is it because there's just too much pressure from within? It, it could be pressure. But I think there's also a huge stigma about acknowledging that something is wrong. Like even though I tour a show, it's called Wong Clover the Cuckoo's Nest, I tour a show about depression and suicide, even I have a hard time copying to uh, my own struggles growing up because of what that makes me seem like. It, 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 already I feel somewhat invisible of, uh, as, a, as an Asian woman. And if on top of that, uh, I, I am labeled depressed, I become sort of like a stock photo of a, a depressed Asian woman and I don't, I, I, for me, I have a hard time letting people label me that way. So I can see why that's difficult. I think it's also that these, uh, that it's like I had said, it's it's difficult for for some Asian Americans to grab to understand what what therapy is, and most modalities are Western talk therapy modalities, and seem can seem very foreign, um, and they are not. Uh, doing great jobs, I think, of, of understanding that this is a community that needs to be reached in a more specific way and that these stigmas exist and not to just go off, they look fine to me, but to understand that if high, suicide and depression rates are higher, that uh, that there needs to be a, a, another way to get into that community to um, get people help. And, well, and it's just a I shame like around that. looking for help. Ova, go ahead. Uh, yeah, what, what Christina is saying really resonates with me as well. Um, Having toured Refugee Nation, a play that I co-wrote with my uh, partner in crime, Leilani Chan, um, which is about the Lao American experience. And one of the things is uh, that a as an artist, I mean, I, I reflect the community that uh, we, we do and the good and the bad. And one of the issues that, that always comes up is that, you know, there are gang problems for the Lao American youth and Southeast Asian youth. Uh, what's interesting to me is that, uh, you know, from the community, sometimes they don't want to see that. <laughs> they don't want to see the bad. They only want to see their good. Oh, you know, the, the traditional Lao stuff or, you know, the folk dance. And no, no, I mean, you know, there, there's more to it than that. And is this the model minority? Uh-uh. It's mm. the myth. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's where I come, you know, and, and I'm one of those voices that, you know, wants to, again, reflect the community. And so um, mm -hmm. I'll props to that. Christina, too. <laughs> Thank you, Opa. Um, Malika, <laughs> people are talking about obstacles, and, wanna, and I just want to share one tweet to, to talk because we've been talking about what Pakao's saying, you know, mental health, refugee, but other two issues were language and civic yeah. disenfranchisement, yes. um, the political process. So I want to ask the professor, you know, talking about political engagement mm -hmm. for the Asian American community mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and how, you know, how do you become more, you know, move away from disenfranchisement? Like what, 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 how does that go? You know, how do you, how do you achieve that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I th well, first of all, I should, my disclaimer is I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I can play one on TV. <laughs> um, you know, I think that 
one of those damaging um, implications, right, that you be opened up with, Malika, mm -hmm. is that um, the model minority myth is a barrier to what I would say folks in the racial justice movement think about in terms of organizing across racial lines, like um, in, in kind of multiracial movements, because um, the model minority concept really makes Asian Americans seem not like black folks, not like other brown folks, right? Or not like even, you know, um, indigenous folks. So one, um, I think one way to start addressing that is to really make it clear that the harmful effects of the model minority stereotype go beyond the Asian American community, right? Because the, the ideology itself uh, reproduces an anti-black racism. It, it also ha it has its roots in an anti-native uh, Hawaiian kind of racism, right? The model minority myth um, actually helped to justify Hawaii becoming a state in the 1950s. Well, is there a difference, mm -hmm. though, I mean, this what you're saying kind of begs the question, is there a difference between whether or not this myth is perpetuated within the Asian American mm -hmm. community or whether it's just outside? I think that's a great question. You know, I've uh, thought a lot about that. Um, I think a lot of it comes to the question of power, right? And we have to understand in some ways where um, ideas about race are made and how they're circulated. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's very powerful for a big um, news organization, let's say CNN, right? Or something. Um, I'll call out any names here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I won't, I won't mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> a, a certain <laughs> Yale Law professor, for instance, right, who has spoken out a lot and, and I would say very much embraced and commodified this stereotype for, you know. Amy Chua? Who? Uh, who? Um, <laughs> I, again, not naming <laughs> names, right? But she herself is in a position of power <laughs> and has hey, the, the access to certain um, channels of communication, right? And so I guess I'm trying to answer your question by saying, uh, it's maybe it's less about within and without Asian American communities, but really, who who is doing the circulation of this right. idea? Who right. are they talking to? Who right. are they ab able to reach? Also, great questions, and I just want for our international audience who Christina was talking to and who Ellen who, talking about and who Ellen was <laughs> very thinly veiled talking about was Amy Chua. Uh, <laughs> the writer of a book about <laughs> tiger moms and them being the reason why Asian kids are the way they are because of their moms. Um, but while Ellen was talking. Suman, you were nodding your head. What was going on? <laughs> well, I was just thinking about, so in particular around civic engagement, right? Um, you know, if you look at the struggles uh, that communities of color in this country have faced to vote, right? Which, you know, of course are manifest continue to manifest in African American communities, have been manifested in Asian American communities, you know, is codified in the Voting Rights Act, you know, South Asian communities continue to face the same uh, barriers, right, around language, but also around access to the polls. You know, I've done poll monitoring for many, many years, um, and I can tell you that almost every election, there is some poll worker in the middle of cosmopolitan New York City, as well as many other cities, who refuses to let an individual who is perhaps South Asian, who is a sick American who's wearing a turban or an individual who is brown who might be Latino or a Chinese grandmother who appears to be limited English proficient there is always a challenge for those folks to be able to record and make their voices heard at the polls right and so the work that we continue to do is to actually actually speak to the shared uh, experience frankly of exclusion and oppression of our communities of South Asian communities with our other communities of color with native communities to be able to speak to how we all need to expand a, the opportunity Opportunity and create more opportunity and a bigger pie for all of us so that we can't be pitted against each other. Uh, all really good recommendations. Um, Christina, I want to go to you before we get the last word from our community. Um, we have about a minute left, and on my screen here is one of the popular memes that's circulating online. This is, if at first you don't succeed, don't come back home, and you see right there an Asian father looking pretty sternly. Christina, is, is, is the way to stop perpetuating things like this to talk about these kind of stereotypes? Is that the way to break them down? And is that necessary? Um, I, yeah, I think that's a place to start. That's definitely a place to start. For me, I, uh, as an artist, I'm always trying to figure out how to subversively as I definitely feel that I do benefit. I, I got a job. I, I'm, I'm like hoarders. If you go to my house, it's like hoarders. But like I got a job once many years ago as an office manager to organize stuff. And so, I mean, there are examples in my life where I've used it. But, it, but it, as an artist, I also feel like this has been a and a comedian. This is sort of a disguise, right? That I look like a harmless Asian woman. And then I come out and I'm like, 
birds coming out of my hands, like middle finger birds, and like. Uh, but I think everyone, a that is Christina in. Wong. She's a comedian, <laughs> and you will see her in the post show. I have to wrap up the main show right now because that's all the time we have. Now on the next show, India's BJP won a landslide, landslide election, sets the controversial Modi to be the next prime minister. What will it mean? We'll tell you tomorrow. In the meantime, we'll see you online. Welcome back, everyone. This is The Stream's online post show. We're talking about the model minority myth and how it impacts Asian Americans in the U.S. Let's get right back to the conversation. I want to go to our community because I know they're tweeting us. They were tweeting they us. They're sending in say. video comments. Yes, of course. And I wanted to share one video comment from Miranda who talks about the stereotype but also about parts of the stereotype being a passion. I don't like when my passions are explained by the model minority myth. Sure, I do like like some of the stereotypical Asian activities, but it's not because it's part of the stereotype, it's because that's my actual passion. So Ova, I have a question for you because when you start talking about the model minority myth and, and the stereotypes, you know, what, uh, people in our community are also saying, you know, I am high achieving, I am someone that does this and I don't want to be defined because of my background. How do you, how, how do you, you know, what would you add to that? Uh, I, I think, I mean, it, uh, from the beginning when uh, Ellen had mentioned it's a double-edged sword, I mean, I, I look at that and I go, well, I'm not perfect. I mean, I'm definitely going to try to succeed and do what I can. And I think that's, that's many of us here in this country. Um, it, it makes me reflect uh, from the conversations before about how um, in Refugee Nation, I, I, in terms of our community, I talk about how here in America, um, there is three mentalities that we have. The refugee mentality, the immigrant mentality, and the citizen mentality. And that's where ultimately we all want to be, to be able to, to engage. But when you're in a refugee status, you're just trying to survive. You're just trying to, you know, uh, keep your family together. When you're in an immigrant uh, status, in the mentality, you are working. You don't have time to have the luxury of going to see theater or, or you know, to be civically engaged. And so it, it takes time. Um, it takes effort, but uh, but it's it's you know getting us to be open and 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 aware of all of that. So, mm -hmm. I want to play a clip. Um, this is a this is a satirical clip. It is from <laughs> Wong Fu Productions. It's called "Do You Love Your Job?" and it's about job ex expectations. This is taking you back to the younger generation, many of whom are watching this show right now, and this is talking about career expectations. So, have a look at this. I know what you're thinking. Asian guy trying to be a basketball player? Psh, good luck. But even after Yao, even while Jeremy Lin, this still looks weird, huh? Well, I don't blame you. Everyone knows that if you're Asian, there are the sacred four pillars of the occupation your family and friends expect you to go into. Medicine. Business or finance. Science and engineering. Oh. Hey! Unfortunately, I suck at all those things, and I'm awesome at basketball. He sucks at those things. He's great at something else. Uh, for all of the panel panelists uh, here on our show today, none of you are in those four categories, at least to my knowledge. So, Suman, what did your parents say? You're, you're the child of Indian immigrants. What did they say um, when you decided to become your current career choice? They said, go show them how it's done, girl. Make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, my awesome parents are really parents. progressive. And, awesome. um, you know, they raised me with a social justice mentality and, to, you know, create more opportunity for other folks. So my dad, to this day, every time I talk to him about some work that I'm doing, he says, give them hell, girl. <laughs> right on. What about you, Ellen? Um, you know, what I'm actually thinking of, there was a Chinese auntie who came to my house when I was uh, in college and she kind of berated me for wanting to go into the humanities. 
And I was just, so I'd like to say to Auntie Rebecca that, uh, you know, it's worked out. And uh, my mom supported me. You know, she helped me through, um, get through graduate school. Mm -hmm. And uh, she isn't around anymore, but I think she would be pretty excited. And is the thinking that behind that auntie's um, words of admonition that what are you going to do with that? You're well, not going to be able to make a lucrative career? I think that's right. I mean, and rightly so, you know, maybe the job path isn't as clear. The opportunities are a little more difficult to find. But, but I think as a community, we have to support, you know, um, a range of passions like we're talking about and uh, and try to get into these different kinds of positions yeah mm -hmm. and uh, and the media and the community is actually talking about voices and amplification of voices and representation and I can see Ova nodding and I'm so I'm gonna set up some tweets and then go to Ova in a second but here's what Dennis is saying he's saying you know lifting up the voices and and working in solidarity with the black and the brown community which is which is something that is a theme that we're hearing and also uh, Lucas who's talking about just Asian faces in the media for him just weren't around while he was growing up so Ova um, you were nodding you're talking about voices you're an actor you know how is, it, first of all, media representation's first part of the question, and how is this changing? Um, how, how are you, how is this changing in terms of the lack, you know, how presenting more voices to reflect this authenticity? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, in terms of the media, obviously, there's still more work to be done. Uh, in terms of having Asian American faces out there in terms of, uh, you know, big media. Um, I myself am one of those uh, change agents. I'm a catalyst, being one of the few Lao American actors out there, having that voice, creating that voice, uh, inspiring and empowering, uh, you know, people through um, the play that I've been doing, Refugee Nation and touring. Um, the impact that we've had has been amazing. Um, Lao American youth and Southeast Asian youth and, and the show itself, uh, you know, it just inspires them to want to um, speak out, to have a voice. Um, and so I'm so happy to be a part of that. And for me, growing up in Hawaii, hello, I know Hawaii was mentioned over there. Um, <laughs> and being from Laos, ending up in Hawaii, being around all these, what we call locals, um, you know, and something about, a, to me, just referenced how um, Asian American to me was even a, a new thing because I never considered myself Asian American until I moved here to the mainland. So, <laughs> which is a whole nother conversation. Um, Especially and so, because yeah, Asia I, is so big. So to be grouped yes. into one Asian American lump does seem yes. a little weird. Yeah, and even within that, I mean, I, I speak about, within the play I talk about, within Laos there are also very, um, 49 different ethnic groups. So even, even though you're from Laos, like for example, you know, you hear about the Hmong, the Hmong are people from Laos, but they are ethnically a, a different ethnic group. And so again, like the diaspora of South Asians, um, we have the same, the same issues. Um, I, another thing I wanted to chime in was just the fact that for me personally, I uh, have had a wonderful supportive mother and a supportive parents who, I mean, she, she wanted me at first to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know, one of those traditional um, you know, but, but that's because I think she re was really concerned about my well-being, knowing that, and that's where she comes from. But she was also very progressive enough, like Suman's parents, to be able to say, hey, go pursue your dream, you know, go for it, see what happens. And here I am, you know, making her proud, making impact in the community. So, hey. That's that's where we're at right now, well, having good, this conversation. Good for you. Well, Christina, I, I want to um, give you an, this next question based on an article that you wrote not too long ago. This is from okay. exojane.com, um, and the article is called, I Thought Being Miserable Was Just Part of Being Chinese. And so the quote that I'm actually <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling out here as we prepare to wrap up this show, you say, I was never raised to be happy as much as I was raised to be successful. So Christina, how do you define today? How do you define success? <laughs> to wrap up with this. Um, I, think, well, I think it's feeling that um, it, it, it's, it's having a personal vision that you're able to own and find your own joy and follow it and, and thrive in, um, in pursuing your own joy and not someone else's vision of joy. And I think that's where a lot of my misery came when I was younger is that there was there was like, there was, you can be this, which is a doctor, and then there was everything else. And, and I was so afraid of that everything else because to me it, it was conflated with failure. And uh, my folks are actually very supportive now. They just constantly need me to hand them a crib sheet to explain to their friends what it is I do. But um, <laughs> other than that, they've been really supportive. So 
Um, Malika, I just want to close with one comment because I think just hearing what everyone's talked about, mm -hmm. I, it's safe to say, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that the guests will agree with this, this comment that comes from Suzanne. She says, as a Japanese American, I reject the model minority. There's no substitute for full equality and equal standing with everybody else. Well, for us all. Someday. <laughs> Thanks to our guests. That's all the time we have for this conversation now. Thank you to Ellen Wu, Christina Wong, Suman Raghunathan, and Ova Saopeng. Now, on the next show, India's BJP has just won a landslide election. What can the world's largest democracy look forward to with the controversial Narendra Modi leading the country? We'll talk about that tomorrow. In the meantime, we'll see you online. Thanks for watching.